سلام و روز بخیر خدمت تمام دوستان من مهداد هستم ببخشید برای اینکه یه مقدار دیر شد شروع برنامه خواستیم یه مقداری بچه ها بیشتر جوین بشن بمون حالا من یه توضیحات کوتاهی در مورد برکل لکچر و برنامه همون میدم امیدوارم دوستان بیشتری به همون ملحق بشن گفتارهای برکلی پس از یک میراث طولانی از سخنرانی ها و بحث های سازماندهی شده توسط ایرانیان در برکلی مانند انجمن دانشجویان در سال 1960 کانون بررسی مسائل ایران کانون سخن و پگاه در دهه 1980 کمیته دفاع از دموکراسی و آزادی اندیشه در ایران 1997 و مرکز گفتگوها سال 2000 در ژانویه سال 2005 تأسیس شدش در گفتارهای برکلی یا همون برکلی لکچر که بسیار از دوستان به این نام میشناسند ما تمام تلاشمون رو کردیم که بتونیم از تمامی عقاید و نظرات افرادی رو دعوت بکنیم و تو این چند سال خیلی خوش وقت هستیم که دوستان زیادی به ما جوین شدن و تونستیم برنامه های تقریبا خوبی داشته باشیم خیلی خوشحال هستم که در خدمت های دکتر پویا علی مقام هستیم امروز فقط یه چیز کوچیکی بگم در مورد برنامه های آینده مون و همچنین اینکه ما رو چطور میتونید دنبال کنیم ما برنامه آینده مون در 15 آگست هست ساعت 11 صبح خدمت های دکتر یونس جلالی هستیم با موضوع سخنرانی قرارداد 25 ساله بین ایران و چین همچنین اگر میخواین خبردار بشین از برنامه های آینده ما میتونید گفتارهای برکلی رو در فضای مجازی مانند فیسبوک، تلگرام و یوتیوب و همچنین میتونید ایمیل های خودتون رو در وبسایت ما به نشانی برکلی لکچرز lectures.org دنبال کنید و اونجا میتونیم ایمیلاتون رو بزنیم و میتونیم برنامه های آینده رو خدمتون عرض کنیم من اول میخوام من بک ان فورت فارسی و انگلیسی میرم به خاطر اینکه برنامه لکچرمون به انگلیسی هستش من یه توضیحی در مورد برنامه امروز میدم موضوع برنامه به انگلیسی و همچنین معرفی های دکتر علی مقام و بعد در خدمتشون هستیم Uh, this presentation explores the role of women in the green uprising in Iran 2009 and how their widespread, widespread involvement brought to the four speeches of the main opposition uh, candidate's wife, Dr. Zahra Rahnavard, and the poster girls of the uprising Neda Sultan to the never ending debate over the mandated veiling of women. Their presence and leadership during the uprising highlights the limits of their state-sponsored empowerment and their struggle for more. Dr. Puyali Maram is a historian of the modern Middle East at MIT. His dissertation title is Contesting the Iranian Revolution, the Green Uprising, was the 2016 winner of the Association for Iranian Studies Mehdad Mashaikhi dissertation award, which is present by Anoli. The manuscript was published in expanded form uh, with Cambridge University Press in 2020. His other articles and book chapters cover the Arab Spring, Iranian protest music, women in, in Middle East revolution, uh, sectarianism, and, uh, and the psychohistory of the post 9-11 discourse. He teaches course on the modern Middle East, the early Islamic period, and in, uh, and in the fall of 2018, he instituted and taught for the first time modern Iran, a century of revolution. Uh, in, the, in the spring of 2019, MIT's School of Humanities Arts and Social Science awarded him the Leviton Teaching Award and award um, that an award was the result of the student initiated process. My uh, lecture is in English, but I'm not sure if I'm in Farsi and English. I'm not sure if I'm in the right way. I'm not sure if I'm in the right way. من خیلی خوشبختم که از دکتر آقای مقام بخوام که برنامه رو شروع کنم ممنون 
Merci, Merta John. Um, hello, everybody. Let me just quickly set this up. All right. So, first of all, it, it's such a wonderful it's such a wonderful opportunity to be here with you. Um, Berkeley lecture series and I go back about twenty years um, when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Um, and I was uh, lucky enough to have a lot of support from Fania Jun. Uh, so it's great to kind of come back full cir circle and instead of being an audience member to now be presenting to you all. Uh, it's a deep honor of mine for certain. And um, thank you for spending your Saturday morning and I guess part of your afternoon with me, your Sunday morning and um, part of your afternoon with me. Um, I do have a disclaimer. Uh, or maybe a couple of disclaimers. First of all, um, I am a native Persian speaker, but I was raised here. And um, while I could speak to you in Persian, I'm just more comfortable speaking and presenting in English. So forgive me, but bear with me. Um, I, I trust it will be a better presentation if I'm doing it in a language that is more comfortable for me. The other disclaimer I had was, um, you, you see this a lot, uh, not only in academia, but anywhere. Wherever there is a space created for women, um, men have to come in there and populate it. Uh, and, and I'm kind of doing that right now. This is a topic that very much pertains to women. Um, and here I am as a man populating the space uh, to present on this issue. Um, I, I, I do want to acknowledge that real quick. But really, the reason why this is happening in the first place was because um, I wrote this dissertation and you know I finished it up in 2015. And um, when I got my when I got my book contract, I had plenty of time to then go back and work on the dissertation, um, expand it and or edit it and publish it as a book. And what I ended up realizing was that. Uh, by being neutral, like I didn't really talk about men or women. I just didn't talk about, you know, gender or, or sex or anything like that. Um, and by virtue of not touching on this subject, I ended up, in my attempt to be neutral, I ended up um, sweeping underneath the Persian rug uh, really important nuances that do indeed pertain to women and gender. Um, so then what I ended up doing before um, I submitted my final manuscript for publication is I went back and I read um, many of the works written by Iranian uh, women anthropologists uh, and historians and sociologists that analyzed Iran from a gender perspective. Um, and a credit to them because I essentially became their student uh, by reading all their works or many of their works. And then I went back and I, I took my dissertation and to the best of my ability, I, I tried to analyze this history, um, not from a neutral genderless perspective, but from one that uh, harnesses the very important presence of Iranian women and the gender issues that came up um, in the speeches before the uprising, before the June 12, 2009, 10th presidential election but also the issues that came up afterwards during the uprising. And so this presentation really is a, is a culmination of the attempt not to be neutral and to acknowledge really important nuances um, that are vital to this history. All right, so the presentation will have uh, 10 or I think maybe 12 or 13 slides. Uh, in those 12 to 13 slides, there are two really short video clips uh, embedded in the slides. Um, our primary focus will be on Hazar Sis Hada Hash of the Hash, no, 2009, uh, the elections there. Um, for the sake of some foregrounding, we have just this one slide that talks about um, the situation, uh, or one aspect of women's situation post revolution. And then we're gonna fast forward to 2009. Uh, and really what we wanna see or, or, or how we wanna begin the, the discussion is essentially the, the situation that the Islamic Republic inherited as it pertained to women, right? So there was a major issue with illiteracy, not only with, with society as a whole, but especially for women, right? So illiteracy for the total population age, age 15 and above, 
was about 75.6% for women. This may be an exaggeration, but this is the stats that I got from um, a lot of the um, academic work produced on the subject. The state's goal was to improve, the Islamic state's goal was to improve uh, schooling as a means to achieve social justice, to close the educational gap that separated the rich from the poor, right? So I want you to kind of think about these things and then we'll talk about how the goal, the state's attempts to empower women in a certain way ends up backfiring against the state. Uh, one, one means by which they were able to kind of close this illiteracy gap and this gap in terms of education between men and women and boys and girls was they, um, as many of you know, they Islamized the school system, um, not just with the cultural revolution. And I think many of you in the audience may have been victims of that cultural uh, revolution where many were expelled from the universities, I think, or you know people that have been. But while that was devastating to so many people, it ended up creating opportunities for, for many young girls at the same time, right? Because a lot of really conservative families uh, were opposed to their little girls going and getting an education, mainly because they saw that sc the schooling system was secular, it was a godless den of vice, and so no matter the attempts of the monarchy before to educate the population, um, this cultural issue kind of uh, became this insurmountable uh, obstacle that the Iranian, the Islamic government then had to address post-revolution. And what they ended up doing was that they, they Islamized the school system, they Islamized the curriculum, um, they had same-sex teachers teaching the same-sex students, and, and then more importantly, what they ended up doing was the, the government ends up sending a lot of clergymen to the countryside to meet with these conservative families. And so the, the government and the clergy were very much part of the process of explaining to these conservative families that the issues they, have, they may have had with educating their daughters before the revolution were no longer valid because of the fact that the system was now Islamized. So you see then a lot of these objections become nullified and a lot of these conservative families begin to send their daughters to school. Uh, the state's goal was to create the ideal female citizen who is socialized, politicized, and Islamized and can serve traditional needs of a religious society as well as modern demands of the country, right? Um, so it's kind of this thing where they wanted to empower the women but also kind of still retain their traditional sensibilities, right? In the revolution's first decade, enrollment in girls' primary schools experienced a 50% increase. By 2008, uh, the eve of the uprising in 2009, literacy rates for women rose dramatically to 96%. By 2009, women constituted the majority of college students, almost half, uh, almost half of all master's level students and 33% of doctoral students. Now, I don't wanna give all the credit to the Iranian government, right? Because as you will see from this lecture, and you don't even need me to tell you this, Iranian girls and Iranian women have long been at the forefront of improving their own plight, but also trying to rectify the issues of the country as a whole, right? But nonetheless, the policies of the state um, did make it easier for a certain class of, of, of women to kind of enter the educational system. Now, the point really here is, these, the, the fact that the majority of college students were Iranian women, or they were such a big, uh, you know, big segment of the graduate student population, really also what happens is that by entering the universities, by entering the educational system, by getting more and more access to the world through these educational centers, they begin to learn about the world beyond their bubbles and the expectations kind of rise as well. More importantly, they're able to connect the dots. They're able to kind of make sense of the injustices that they face, both as Iranians living in an authoritarian state, but also as Iranian women who live in a state that in certain aspects gives preferential treatment to men. So they're able to kind of see the structural injustices, injustices that they face, and then they begin to you know, they begin to get more and more and act more and more active, not only in the reform movement, but in so many different spaces. Uh, they become to be they begun they begin to become more politically aware, engaged, and active. So we're going to fast forward to 2009. Bear with me. So, like 
um, if not all presidential contests in Iran, it's basically a boys show. It's a boys contest, right? So here we have the four main candidates, Ahmednejad, Karubi, Musavi, and Rezai. And some things don't change, right? We, these are faces that we still see except for the two in the middle. Um, but really what was interesting about 2009 was that Musavi also had Dr. Zahra Rahnavar, um, not only beside him as this uh, you know, quiet prop, but she was actually a force in her own right. This is the, uh, the former head of Azahra University. She's a political force in her own right. And she also gave a lot of speeches during the campaign. So she wasn't somebody that just sat or stood quietly beside her, 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 her candidate husband, but she was somebody that was active in the campaign, um, began to give her own speeches. And the speeches were actually very fiery and charismatic, right? And... The, the issues that she talked about ends up uh, resonating with a lot of Iranian women. She condemns the state uh, for not only failing to support women, but allowing men to have multiple, multiple wives in the name of supporting families, right? Um, and then, of course, in this, in this June 9th rally, when she's talking about these issues, then the audience responds in tandem, Rahnavad, Rahnavad, Tasavir Zanomad the equality of women and men, or the equality, equality of women and men. And then she also addresses issues that don't have to do with gender, right? She, she's talking about real politics. She's condemning the fact that Iran has political prisoners, that uh, there should be a right to free speech. She railed against the pol uh, police patrols in the country's overall security climate, growing class disparities, skyrocketing rent prices, the influx of imports that ruined local industries, she's really talking about Chinese imports, youth unemployment, and the availability, availability of cheap and illegal drugs. And this is why in the televised presidential debates, if you remember, um, in 2009, it was the first time, it wasn't the first time we had televised debates, but it was the first time we had televised one-on-one -on -one debates. And the one-on-one -on -one debates were really interesting because they allowed for more adversarial discussions. And in one of those very adversarial discussions, Ahmed Nijad begins to take aim at Rahnavaj, who is not a candidate, right? He, she was the wife of the candidate. But because she had become such a force in her own right, and because she was rallying so many women to Mir Hussein Musavi's candidacy, Ahmed Nijad begins to attack her directly in the debate, right? And this is this, the reason why he does so is because the contest was a boys contest. There were four men candidates. But because of Rahnavad, a lot of women voted for her by voting for her husband, right? So in a way she had become a candidate in her own way, kind of like a, maybe like a, a vice presidential candidate, if, you could, if we could say that, right? All right, so, <clears throat> Excuse me. So by way of just a quick um, context building measure as to what happened in 2009, we know that in 2005, after eight years of, ref of a reformist presidency that ended in deadlock, uh, a lot of youth boycotted the 2005 presidential election. A lot of youth and a lot of women and a lot of women youth boycotted the election. And then they got stuck with Ahmadinejad. The idea was that in 2005, our vote doesn't matter. Everything's controlled by the Guardian Council. Everything, all the candidates are screened and vetted. Uh, we're not going to vote anymore. Reform doesn't mean anything. It, it can't change the system. And then they got stuck with someone like Ahmed Nijad, who appointed military uh, commanders, um, Safar uh, Pastoran, Revolutionary Guards commanders, to his cabinet. I think about half, or maybe just slightly the majority of his cabinet members were guardsmen commanders who had no real history in governments. It had no experience in governance. Uh, these were military commanders and all of a sudden they were in charge with uh, you know, running the day-to-day -day of the country. And um, the country begins to get more and more militarized, a securitization of the states, right? This is, if you remember, this is 2005 where American forces were fighting in Afghanistan to Iran's East. American forces uh, were fighting and occupying Iraq to Iran's West. And of course, the Persian Gulf has long been really not an Arab Gulf or, any, or Persian Gulf, but an American Gulf. So Iran was being surrounded 
And so Ahmadinejad comes in and he leads or he spearheads a securitization of the state. And this begins to impact the population domestically. So in 2009, uh, and by the way, none of the cabinet members in, in his, uh, in his um, cabinet were women, if I recall correctly. I think after 2009, when he supposedly won his, his reelection, I think he appoints one or two, maybe three, if I recall correctly. Anyways, so in 2009, there was renewed calls for a boycott. And the boycott, the boycott calls fell on deaf ears because a lot of those in the country um, understood that while the system is controlled, while the elections are highly controlled, whether Ahmadinejad is an office or not actually has a material impact in their lives, right? So they, they were not keen to boycott. And then the televised debates happened. The televised debates were really interesting because they got people really interested in the, in the, in the uh, elections, right? Because the stuff that Musavi and Kaurimi and them were talking about was stuff that was people talked about at home, like corruption and repression and all these things. They talked about it at home, all of a sudden it was being talked on a national audience on TV. So they begin to realize there is a fundamental difference between Musavi and Ahmadinejad. Now, the interesting, the really interesting thing about 2009 is that the government, even today, really wants people to participate in elections, right? It doesn't want people to boycott it because a, bo a boycotting of the system is essentially a no vote. A boycotting of the elections is a no vote to the system. At the same time, if you participate in the elections, by default, you're, you're participating in a very important state-sanctioned event, political event. And by default, you are acknowledging the legitimacy of the system, right? So the government wants people to vote, right? The Iranian government very much wants people to vote. And in 2009, to get people excited about the elections, especially after the boycott of 2005, in 2009, the government begins to relax the normal repressive political environment in the country, right? It, a lot of internet restrictions were decreased. Um, people were begin people were beginning to pro uh, not protest but organize, and nothing was happening to them. They weren't suffering from political repercussions. And many people realize that there's an opportunity now. Something was different about the climate, the political climate. And that difference is an opportunity to mobilize. So you really kind of see that the campaign in 2009 was different than other campaigns because it wasn't a typical campaign. It was it had morphed into a street movement. Many people use the political cover afforded to them because of the presidential campaigns to mobilize against the system. Some were indeed mobilizing for their candidates, but some were mobilizing against the system as a whole, and they used the cover of the elections to do so. So before the election results, before the so-called Ahmadinejad's election win, there was even moments in Tehran where people were saying, people were organizing for Musavi, but were also airing slogans against the state. And one slogan that I think is probably the most intense before the election results were announced was Mag bar Taliban, Chedar Kabul, Chedar Tehran. This was, a, this was a slogan aired publicly on the streets of Tehran in 2009. You hear that stuff now because there's so much discontent, but a lot of this stuff was taboo to be aired on the streets publicly in 2009. So I, I think everyone here is a Persian speaker, but for the sake of being thorough, that slogan meant death to the Taliban, whether in Kabul or in Tehran. So the idea was they were equating clerical rule in Tehran or in Iran with the extreme fundamentalism of the Wahhabi Taliban in Afghanistan. Now, the IRGC commanders were, saw what was happening on the streets before the elections. They saw that this campaign was turning into a massive street movement. And they, they actually came out. The, the commander of Tehran came out and said that um, Musavi is trying to use his presidential campaign to launch a Engalaba uh, Mahmali, a velvet revolution, and any such revolution will be nipped in the bud. They actually said that. <clears throat> uh, I, I think it probably didn't help <laughs> that the green the, the campaign ended up adopting the color green, green being the color of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad's favorite color. Um, so it ended up very much looking like a color revolution was unfolding, obviously. All right, so June 12th was the election 
the uh, the results were uh, announced really early that evening. Uh, there was widespread allegations of fraud. The next day, there were rioting. Um, I think the emotions of a lot of people got the best of them, and there was rioting. And then the bad press from the Iranian government uh, prompted them to um, kind of get hold of their emotions. And really, a lot of people begin to, began to come out, too. So June 12th, we see a, a massive peaceful protest. And on June 15th, we're going to see in the next slide a video of this super epic march, just not in Tehran only, but in Tehran, about 3 million people gathered. We'll get, we'll get to the debate behind that number in just a moment. Um, the elections were held on a Friday. So the following Friday, um, Ayatollah Khamenei gave his sermon, what the opposition called uh, the, the Sermon of Blood. And the next day, uh, basically during the sermon, he announced that the next day there's gonna be a crackdown because the elections were fair. They have been investigated and ratified by the Guardian Council. Um, now it's a security issue. The Zionists, the imperialists, the Americans, they're all at the door trying to take advantage of the situation. So a crackdown will be in full force the following day and onwards. Any blood that's spilled, Khamenei said, will be on the hands of the organizers and the leaders of the opposition. Excuse me, the leaders of the opposition, essentially uh, Rahnabad, Musavi, and Karabi. Now, the interesting thing is the protests from, from June 13th all the way until Friday, the, the sermon, were daily. And then once the crackdown happens, the one continuous uprising um, becomes many, right? Because they, the, the movement was driven underground afterwards, but then begins to resurface. Um, and the next six months on multiple days where the Iranian government wants people to come out, but wants them to come out for its own purposes. So Ruzakos. Ruzakots, Jerusalem Day. Jerusalem, Jerusalem Day, the last Friday of Ramadan, is a day where the Iranian government wants its supporters to come out and protest in solidarity with the Palestinians against the Israelis, right? So then once the Green Movement was driven underground, it came out on these days to then protest not Israel, but those occupying power in Tehran, right? So you see, you see how the uprising kind of becomes not one continuous one, but many, right? Which is why I call it um, the green uprisings in many, in many places where I talk about it, I call it the green uprisings. <clears throat> All right, so here's that June 15th epic march. Um, you know, what is the green movement? In Rahnava's estimation, the revolt created the space for millions of Iranians from all from other social movements, such as the women's movement, the labor movement, the students' movement, and the teachers' movement, amongst others, to protest under the umbrella, the umbrella of the green movement. So I would say the green movement is more like an umbrella, right? So I want you guys to really quickly just watch this, and I'll, we're gonna have a quick, you know, um, focus on why this footage is actually very important. Oops. So, I mean, it's, the rest of the video is essentially the same um, bit of footage. Really what's interesting about this was because at the time, Tehran's mayor, Qalibov, uh, acknowledged on, on Iranian media that was published on a website that 3 million people came out in Tehran. And then soon after this acknowledgement, that piece of news was deleted from the Iranian uh, state-controlled uh, websites, right? So they didn't want any Iranian official acknowledging 3 million people. But this is why the internet sometimes, today it's weird because there's a lot of um, fake news and like false information and dark web stuff, but the internet still has a lot of really good things about it uh, in terms of information. And one is that <coughs> Iranian protesters themselves, the state did not televise their revolution. The, the Iranian protesters themselves recorded 
uploaded and socially broadcast their own revolution. So if the, if the revolution isn't going to be televised, they made sure that it was at least socially broadcast. And this is their own footage that shows that there was indeed a massive turnout. So even if the internet, even if the Iranian government wants to delete what uh, Qalibov said, doesn't want to acknowledge anything, the internet keeps receipts. And this, this footage is out there and it's really important. This is why kind of doing the research on the Green Movement was so fascinating because I didn't have to wait for 30 or 40 years for the Iranian government or for the American government to declassify its information, right? Um, even when it comes to the coup of 1953, uh, Yervanda Abrahamian, the the um, the you know most renowned historian in the English language uh, of Iran in, in the world today, in my opinion, he argued in his book on the coup. I think the book came out in 2013, saying that the 30-year rule doesn't apply when it comes to Iran. Uh, after 50 or 60 years, as a seasoned historian, he could not. He still could not access a lot of classified state media, uh, state cables, uh, diplomatic cables from the from the State Department. The State Department is supposed to declassify these after 30 years, but when it came to Iran, wouldn't do it. So doing the research for the Green Movement was really fascinating because all of it was online. It was all on the internet. You just had to, you know, go about, you know, one by one piecing it together and, and, and finding the people who participated in this history. All right. So, you know, if, we, if we're going to talk about the figurehead of the, the female figurehead of the movement, which is Zahra and Ahnavar, and we're going to talk about women being so active in this movement, it should then come as no surprise that there wasn't a poster boy for the movement, but a poster girl. We, we use the phrase poster boy when we talk about somebody, but in this case, it was a poster girl. The day after Khamenei's Friday sermon, it was a day that Neda Agha Sultan was killed uh, when she got hit in the chest with a bullet, probably by, um, you know, a Basish sniper. We don't really know. The Iranian government obviously denies it. Um, says that it was, it was framed so that people would be galvanized against it. Uh, did, her death becomes the most televised death in history. Think about that for a moment. This is 2009. This is the first uprising where modern technology, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, text messaging, uh, all these things are being utilized to document it all, right? And then a death happens that was shown around the world because by then the Iranian government had kicked out the international media, right? So international media became dependent on the footage that Iranian activists or citizen journalists were documenting and uploading onto YouTube themselves. And this, goes, this gets picked up by CNN and is broadcast around the world, right? Now, the... It, her death was deeply traumatic, um, but it does one of two things. One is that it, it kind of showcases for the world the brutality of the Iranian government's crackdown on really a, a, a nonviolent protest movement, right? But, and, and it, it galvanizes international support for the movement, but it also does something that ended up harming the movement. It had a chilling effect, right? So, a lot of mothers and fathers who were sympathetic to their sons and daughters, um, because they themselves as, as youth and the, were active in the revolution, and now their sons and daughters are picking up the mantle and carrying forth the flame of liberation and freedom. Now all of a sudden, someone is very brutally murdered and it's being shown around the world and they're seeing it. And while they're sympathetic to their sons and daughters, they don't want to see what happened to Neda happen to their own daughters. So especially their daughters, sons, but also their daughters. So you see after her death, um, the numbers gradually, begin, the numbers of people coming out into the street because of the crackdown, they, get, they, get, they begin to lessen, right? Now, the interesting thing is they lessen and either the people that continue to come out were the more radical ones. So then the slogans begin to change. So in June, it was, where is my vote? In December, during Muharram, it was, in Mah Ma'ekhunas, Sayyid Ali Sarnagunas. So either the, the ones who were worried and about their own deaths or obviously didn't want to come out, and then the more committed, the more radical continued to come out, or the brutality of the state radicalized some. But nonetheless, the movement, the numbers begin to decrease by December, but the slogans begin to get radical, more and more radical. 
All right. So um, here is, remember I told you guys that once the protest movement was driven underground, uh, it began to resurface on specific days of action. So one day of action was Ayatollah Beheshti's, uh, what the Iranian state called martyrdom. Uh, people gathered for his. Uh, that was the first gathering post, post crackdown to come out against the election results. Another one was um, Jerusalem Day, which was September 18th, 2009 at the time. Then it was the anniversary of the seizure of the US embassy. Uh, then December was really interesting because December had multiple days of action, right? I had Ruza Donishu, National Student Day, right? So National Student Day, for many of you, you're going to remember this. I wasn't alive at the time. But in the 60s and 70s, ever since the coup in Iran, when Student Day was born, Student Day was born um, when Nixon visited Iran after Eisenhower overthrew Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh's um, democratic and nationalist governments. Uh, protesters at the University of Tehran protested Nixon's arrival, and three of them were killed. Ever since that day, um, there's been a National Student Day. And in the run-up to the Iranian Revolution in the 70s, it was a day of radical protest. And it, it, many students since 1953 have died protesting the Shah's regime. After the Iranian Revolution, the Iranian government tried really ha hard to co-opt all these events, right? To make it part of its political calendar, right? So National Student Day had become something of the sorts where Iranian leaders would go to the universities on National Student Day and talk about academics and the responsibility of students to help build the country and all these things. And um, they you know, obviously should come as no surprise either that the Iranian government post-revolution established its most important prayer hall at the University of Tehran, the most politically active university in the country. So the Iranian government has been trying everything it could to de-radicalize the universities. It gives preferential treatment to Basij students or sons of veterans of the Iran-Iraq war. It builds mosques in the universities. Um, and, then it, it, uh, and then its officials come out on National Student Day to give these really boring speeches about students and their obligation to the country. But on the National Student Day post-elections, um, we could call it the return of the original National Student Day, right? It became a day to renew the uprising, right? So here is the all-girls high school. Um, and you're gonna, I'm gonna play the video for you. It's, it's, it's pretty fiery. And that's one thing I, like, I really like about it. Not to romanticize radical protests, but it has really good energy. Uh, these are the slogans all the way to the left uh, in English, and you're gonna hear them in Persian right now. Okay, so a couple of things if you notice. One is the footage is showing people from behind, right? That's to conceal their identity for security purposes, obviously. Um, some are wearing face masks. This is way before COVID. This is 2009, right? So the, the masks are not to prevent infection from a coronavirus, right? This is, these are, again, masks to conceal their identities. And if you look, a lot of them are wearing green, right? That's green for the color of the uprising. Now, slogan two, and slogan four, these are slogans recycled from the Iranian revolution. And this is kind of the ingenious part of the green movement is that the green movement took all, the, all this history, both Islamic history, like Ashura, Muharram, you know, 
And then the history of the Iranian revolution, um, like these slogans, and they reprogrammed it and they, they then leveled it against the state that came to power through these histories. So in a way, the Green Movement, while it may have failed, it may have failed to abrogate Ahmadinejad's election results, or it may have failed to overthrow the, the system that ratified the election results, but it succeeds in so many different ways. That's essentially the, the big takeaway from my research and, and my book, is to show everybody that the Green Movement, while it had those very obvious failures, had a lot of stealth victories. Victories that, in my opinion, continue onto this very day, like robbing the system of its sources of legitimacy, right? Uh, it contested ownership of those sources of legitimacy, right? So if, if the Iranian government, for instance, championed Palestinian liberation and then used the support that it gave the Palestinians to then say, <laughs> we're legitimate, you should support us. If you support the Palestinians, you should support us. On Jerusalem Day, of all days, Jerusalem Day, protesters came out and said, Madam Chera Nishastin, Iran should the Palestine. As in, oh, like, oh, people, like Iran has become occupied um, the way Palestine has become occupied. And if, if the occupation of Palestine is bad, the occupation of power in Iran is also something to be opposed. They also said, Iran. These are both things I really kind of uh, unpack it in, in chapter four of my book. All right, <clears throat> we're reaching kind of like the last five minutes, so bear with me. Now I mentioned, uh, we mentioned in the introduction that there's a discussion about the hijab to be had, right? Now there is this focus in the West to talk about the hijab, right? There's just like this focus and obsession about it. I don't, I don't mean to play into that obsession, you guys. But something really interesting happened in, in this uprising that has to do with the hijab. Okay, so first we know that uh, these are, these are this, the bottom uh, text, these are quotes from Motahari, right? One of the big proponents of the veil. Motahari argued that um, if we, you know, veiling helps to um, prevent premarital um, sex and um, will help strengthen the institution of the family and um, covered women in schools and in workplaces will be less distracting to men and it'll pr improve productivity in the workforce. Um, but really all this is about creating a moral society. So anywhere in the world really, when, when these really conservative leaders, whether they're Muslim or otherwise, when they want to create a moral society, they almost always begin with targeting a woman's body. Right. So the Iranian government in that regards is no different, although it went above and beyond the, the normal targeting. Right. And here we have, um, you know, protests that happened uh, after the, uh, the um, after Khomeini made veiling mandatory and what one historian called the largest spontaneous demonstrations in the history of women's movement in Iran. Right. Um, and the idea was that even veiled women were, were opposed to it becoming mandatory. Now, the hijab, if you look at the top, I have here the, the hijab's elasticity. Like think of the hijab not only as a garment, but as like a rubber band that you can stretch and pull in, and it has different uses, right? So for the Iranian government, it's always about, veiling is about creating this culturally authentic, you know, country that's in harmony with its history and its culture. And it's not West toxified, right? Um, but it's about creating a moral society. Some have argued it's also about control, right? Like people, men and women are being dictated to how they should dress and act. And that's a form of control, right? Control that extends onto their bodies, right? The government is now extending its sovereignty onto the bodies of its population. Now, the really interesting thing is, is that you really kind of see this hijab not only as about creating a moral society, but as a weapon when it came to how it was used in 2009. So Majid Tavakuli is in me, I hope you all know, Majid Tavakuli had been arrested a number of times as a student activist before 2009. In 2009, he gave a very powerful speech. Uh, I think it was at Danish uh, Kadeh, Amir Kabir. And he said, we will no longer accept tyranny. And then he was arrested because of this. And, and the thing is like, he knew, I, I, I assume he knew he was going to be arrested for this. That's how fearless he was, because he had been arrested a number of times.
then to the Iranian government to really embarrass him, posted a picture of him, this picture of him on the right, right in the hijab. And the Iranian government posted this on its media saying that Majid Tamakoli to evade arrest, put on women's clothing like the hijab. Activists then argue that no, the Iranian government is trying to emasculate and castrate and embarrass him by forcing the hijab onto him and then taking this photo. And then um, the Iranian government actually ended up posting the footage, this photo alongside, I'm sure you all recognize the guy in the middle, that's Bani Saad, right? The, the whole thing was that Bani Saad, or the allegation was that he fled the country in 81 by wearing the veil to conceal his identity. Now, the really interesting thing about this was that there was this be a man campaign that emerged online after this. Many of you may re remember this in 2009. So then men inside Iran and outside of Iran, Iranian and non-Iranian, bearded or without a beard, began to wear this veil and take photos of themselves and post it online in solidarity with Majid Tabakoli. And they called it the be a man campaign. And that's really the irony of it all. It's called the be a man campaign, be a man. So, the hijab here is being used as a way to emasculate and embarrass one of the icons of the movement, Banji Tabakoli, right? So a very male dominated state is putting this woman's garment on another man. And then Iranian men inside and outside the country are now donning this woman's garment again, to kind of show their political solidarity with Banji Tabakoli. And all this kind of shows that the hijab is something that for many women in the country, it's something that is man, it's, it's decided by men, right? And it kind of showcases the fact that this is indeed in many places and spaces, the hijab is about control and it's a weapon. And that's why you see today, a lot of Iranian women, like you see on the second to the right, Vida Mubahed, taking off the hijab. They're not really, Taking it off, she maybe I don't know, but many women who are opposed to the job, they're not they're not opposed to it because they don't they hate Islam or they don't believe in God. They're opposed to that control mechanism of it that we really kind of see if men couldn't agree to it that it, it was a mechanism of control for women. The way it was weaponized against Majid Tabakoli should really kind of end that debate. Um, this, these are the last two slides I promised. Uh, this was a really uh, cool image by Bolok uh, Nafisi. Uh, that's also in chapter four of the book. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a picture of two women, one Iranian, one uh, Palestinian, in solidarity for freedom, wrapped in barbed wire because they both face a security reality, both carrying doves, the symbol of peace, raising um, two nonviolent hands, no machine guns or RPG or anything like that. Um, that, that could either be a V for victory or, P, uh, or, or peace sign, right? Both of them kind of, they represent both in a way. I actually had to talk to activists to find out. They're not wearing the hijab, but they are covering their faces, right? To conceal their identities. And I just thought this was a really poignant uh, image that kind of says a lot. And so I guess really to kind of wrap it up, um, you know, 2009 was unique in the sense that women were so obvious in their involvement. They were so at the forefront of the movement. But that's been the history of, of modern Iran, really. The history of modern Iran, from all the way to the Constitutional Revolution, to the Iranian Revolution, all the way to Vida Mubahedo, uh, the, the Blue Girl Sahar uh, Khodayari, uh, women are really kind of at the forefront of change, really because those who are most oppressed become the incubators of revolution. All this um, and so much more are, are points that are, I've raised in my book, Contesting the Iranian Revolution, The Green Uprisings. Uh, if you end up getting this book, uh, you can get it wherever books are sold. If you end up getting it, please read it. And then if you read it and you like it, don't let it sit on your bookshelves. Please pass it off to a friend or neighbor, encourage them to read it. It's not really about me, it's about this history. I'm not really present in the book. There's no really I talk or first person talk. This is a history that's deeply important to me. I put years into this uh, and I hope that um, many of you find the time to read it. Thank you so much for joining me and I look forward to your questions. Mamnun, Janavari Dr. Ali Magam. Ma so far, set of soal darim, set of chart soal darim. Ma be tartib mi porsam as pad mayatun. Mamnun, ad barnam khali.
جالب و قشنگی بود Uh, the first question is what is or lesson learned in green, green movement inside outside Iran? Uh, the lessons, um, I, well, there's many lessons to be learned. One is that um, organizations matter, right? And, a, and, a, and ideology matters, right? One of the things that uh, the green movement didn't have was was leadership. It, it didn't have leadership. That was its, its strength, but also its weakness, right? So Musavi was a, was a poster boy, but he wasn't, call, he wasn't deciding events. He wasn't organizing anything. A lot of events that happened were spontaneous and they took him by surprise. But the fact that there was no leadership was actually one of his strengths. That's why I, I talked about Zahra, Nah, Rah, Zahra Rah Navar talking about how the movement is an umbrella. Because it didn't have an ideology, because it didn't have real organizations behind it or a real leadership behind it, it allowed for everyone to get involved. And that's why it was so massive at first, right? But but the, the shortcomings to that, the pitfalls to not having organization and leadership is, is that you don't, you can't present what you want. You don't have an ideology. Like at, at the time of the Iranian revolution, the opposition had ideology. It had so many ideologies, right? That the triumph of any one of them, Mujahideen, the Fadayan, the left in general, the Islamists, the nationalists, the Republicans, any of them were to win, the monarchy would have to cease to exist, right? Whereas the, the green movement was a mass-based bottom-up approach and 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 the great and the uh, Arab Spring is very much the same way, right? The Arab Spring was a mass-based, bottom-up approach that tried to put pressure from below on the masses, from below onto the state for the state to fix itself, right? So you see that in in Egypt in 2011, this was a much bigger uprising than the Green Movement, but then victory, at least the initial victory, was when the state overthrew Hosni Mubarak, but then nothing else really changed, right? Whereas in the Iranian revolution, the entire system was overthrown. The billionaire class, the media, everything changed, right? The entire landscape of the country changed. But th that's what happens when you have leadership and ideology, right? But we are now in a um, neoliberal era where ideologies are really about there are no ideologies. That it, the opposition has accepted the neoliberal framework in a way of the state. So that's its strength and its weakness. I think the other lesson to be learned is that how the movement kind of ended. The movement, in my opinion, isn't over because it has kind of transformed and is connected to other events that have happened in Iran since. Connected. But one thing, one thing that was a lesson was that the Iranian government today is not like the Shah's government. It's, it's far more oppressive, far more organized, far more dedicated to staying in power. And it has a bigger base of support than the Shah ever did. And that's how the movement um, kind of reached a um, death knell. Because December, had, we had three events, three major events. National Student Day, the death of Ayatollah Montazeri, this was December 20th or 19th. And then we had Ashura. These are three days in December. Then in February for Bisudoy Bahman, the anniversary of the revolution, this is Iran's biggest political holiday, right? Everybody, if, if you think of the if you think of Bisudoy Bahman as a poker game, the Iranian government went all in and the opposition went all in. The idea was that on this day, we're going to overthrow the system. And then the Iranian government was on this day, we're going to end the green movement. And then it, what the Iranian government ended up doing was if Bisudo Bahman fell on a Wednesday and Friday is a day of rest, they announced that Saturday is gonna, uh, Friday is going to be, a, uh, Thursday is going to be a holiday, holiday. So then there's Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday off. So a lot of people ended up going to on vacation or going, you know, Stromana, wherever they go. And then the Iranian government um, lined the streets up with its, with its own massive streets on Tehran and elsewhere, lined it up with loudspeakers. So that if there are going to be anti-government slogans, they're going to be drowned out. Then it busted in millions of its own supporters. And then Bassages went around shooting people with uh, paintball, paint guns, so that they could tag people who were protesting against them and then like chase after them later, 
And so what ended up happening on Bismillah Bahman, what, what the Iranian government called Yom Allah, the Day of God, was that literally millions of people came out in support of the Iranian government, or at least the Iranian government presented them as coming out in support. Some of the people were there because they had to go there, or some of them were there because they really wanted to go there. I don't want to deny anybody their agency. But when the opposition saw this, that's when they were completely demoralized. So I think one of the lessons we should take is that the Iranian government may not have popular support, may not have majority support, but in a country of 84, 83, 84 million people, um, 10 or 15 or 20 or 25% support, that's still a lot of people. They showed up for the Iranian government, I don't know if they would show up today because a lot has happened since 2009, but those who support the government are, are pretty dedicated to it. That's one lesson we kind of really have to kind of wrap our heads around. The Shah never had that kind of support. It was it did not have the Revolutionary Guards that the Shah that the Iranian government has. The Iranian government has multiple layers of security force. The Shah didn't. So the state is able to put down uprisings much more effectively than the Shah ever did. And the state is so powerful that not only has it dealt with its own domestic opposition but it has also helped prop up other states in the region, like in Syria. So these are really important lessons that I think we could learn from this history. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question is, what is the difference between Green, Green Movement and most recent movement in Iran? Yeah, a lot of differences. Um, I think that, uh, well, I think that, you know, th there's obvious differences, right? There's, there's the differences in class makeup. Like if the Green Movement is a largely middle-class movement, um, the, the protests that happened in, the, in, in 2017 or late 2017, early 2018 were in the countryside or, or much more worker involvement. Um, uh, both, to be honest with you, both the state has been much more violent and then the protests have been violent too. Like the... Um, the protests in Aban Ma, uh, I think like I read like 1,500 banks were torched. Uh, there's a lot, and, and the, the government killed maybe 1,000 to 1,500 people, right? This is in one week. In the entire six month history of the Green Movement, the Iranian government killed close to 112 people. We have all their names and, and, and backgrounds and identities, maybe more, but nowhere near 1,500 in a week. So I think there's a lot of things that are different, but one thing to really kind of consider is that there's more history now. So these events are connected. So no one today is protesting Ahmadinejad's election win from 2009, but the stuff that happened in 2009 has carried to the present. And what I mean by that is when the Green Movement began, like I said, it began with, where's my vote? And it end with Magbar Khamenei, right? These are all taboos that the Green Movement broke and shattered, right? To publicly come out against the in entire system of the Velayat al wasn't it wasn't public the way it was. So when the Green Movement was finally put down in February 2010, whatever protests that happened since then, the slogans picked the intensity of the slogans picked up right where the Green Movement was left off or was put down because the Iranian government doesn't have the legitimacy that it had, doesn't have it anymore. Because in my opinion, and this is the whole point of my research, the Green Movement attacked every source of the Iranian government's legitimacy. It attacked, it appropriated, it co-opted, it subverted, and it used it against the Iranian government. So whatever happens now, since then, these protests are building on that history. Right? There, there's, there's more history of subversion against the state that whatever ha protests happened since then, they're building on that momentum. These protests don't happen in isolation from one another. Right? Some of the slogans from the group movements are being recycled. These are slogans that are variations or the exact replicas of group movement slogans. So there's connectivity. And I think that um, there, there's differences, there's similarities, and then there's continuity. 
Thank you. Another question is many social media got banned in Iran after green movement. Could you expand on it, please? Yeah. So a, a lot of social, a lot of internet restrictions were lightened or lessened to get people to go online and talk about their candidates. This is before the vote in 2011, 2009. People, the Iranian government wanted people talking about the election. They wanted people talking about it anywhere and everywhere they can, even online, even in forums online. After the, after the election results, all those restrictions were reintroduced to the system. Now, the very interesting thing is, is that if you compare the Iranian government's response to the Egyptian government's response, you see how much better the Iranian government is at repression. The Egyptian government in 2011 brought down the internet. So people who were angry with, the, with uh, Hosni Mubarak and, and were inspired by Tunisia, there was no reason for them to stay at home. There was no internet. They couldn't, they were bored. So they were already anger, angered and now they didn't have anything to distract them from them, right? This is the same thing that happened with George Floyd. Everyone saw the George, George Floyd murdered and they were really upset about it, rightfully. But there was, everything had been suspended. There was no sports. There was nothing being televised on TV. So people were angry and then they were bored too. The Iranian government's approach was different. They didn't bring down the internet. They just really slowed it down. So people could sit behind their computers and wait for the pages to load, right? They did block uh, Facebook and all that, but Facebook and, and Twitter, their role was really exaggerated in the West, right? The, the, the Western media called it the Twitter revolution, mainly because a lot of Western journalists were following the, can, uh, the accounts of um, Iranian activists in English um, because they're Western journalists, right? So they want to follow somebody who's writing in English. And they followed really a handful of Iranian English-speaking Twitter accounts. And they thought these people were inside the country and they weren't, right? So really what, what, what ends up happening is social media was not that important in organizing. Social media and, and YouTube were important and telling the world what was happening, right? And even then, like I said, the, the internet wasn't brought down, but these, these restrictions were introduced. So what people ended up doing was they learned how to, well, they, they filmed events like the, like the 3 million person march we saw in Tehran, they filmed it, but they couldn't upload it onto YouTube themselves. So what they ended up doing was they learned how to decrease the file size and then they uploaded onto Dropbox. And then their cousins or their friends or fellow activists abroad would then go and download it from Dropbox and then they would upload it onto YouTube. There was one uh, person, this point man in New York named Mehdi Saharqi, whose father uh, was in, in prison in Iran. He was a person who was very vocal about it. He was time stamping everything and uploading it. And I ended up interviewing him. And he, he, was, he was very open about it. He's like, I wanna document everything that's happening because the more eyes are on the Iranian government, the less inclined it is to harm people, right? Because that's one of the reasons why the Iranian government expelled all the journalists in the country was because it, it didn't want people to see what was going to happen. But then everyone was documenting everything anyways. And the more eyes are on you, the less inclined you are to commit a crime, right? And so I would say social media was important in documentation or, or reaching an outside audience. Um, in creative ways, but not really in terms of organizing. I think text messaging and word of mouth from, from what my research and from what I heard from activists were a much bigger way of coordinating. Thank you. Another question is, how do you see the green movement, civil movement or political? Depends on who you're talking to, right? So it was both, right? Uh, and that's really kind of, this is the only time in my book you'll hear me talk in the first person. That's in the end of the introduction where I'm giving a disclaimer. Like I, I basically said, I cannot claim to speak for a, a multifaceted, multidimensional movement that, in, that encompasses millions of people because everyone came into it with their own grievances. And, and that's why Zahra Rahnavar talked about it being an umbrella. Hamid Dabashi calls it a civil rights movement, right? And I understand why, because it wasn't, initially at least, it wasn't about overthrowing the system. I call it a revolutionary movement because revolutionary is one of those things where it's really vague 
right? It could mean anything, right? What does revolution mean? Is it Marxist? Are they trying to change the um, social relations here, social relations with the modes of production? Uh, is it revolution in the sense they want to abrogate the Islamic Republic and declare a republic? It could mean a lot of things, right? What I thought was useful, uh, what I learned from my own from my own research and from what people in the movement ended up putting down online or in YouTube videos or in their interviews with me was that they didn't actually call it revolutionary, but it was revolutionary in a way that it was different from all the other movements, all the other protests that happened in Iran since, 2000, since 1979. It was different from the, the Kuwa Danishka, the protests at the dormitories in 1999. It was different from the Al-Rajari protests in 2003. It was different and that's what made it revolutionary was because they took all the symbols of the government's sources of legitimization or legitimacy and, and, and seized them from the government and used it against it. And in that way, in my opinion, it was very revolutionary. Thank you. Another question is, uh, what has been the impact of the green movement to, movement, uh, to, to women, women movement in Iran? Uh, I'll give you a, a very shallow answer, and then I'll give you uh, a, a, a hopefully a more in-depth answer. The shallow answer would be even Ahmadinejad in his second uh, term in offense was um, shocked by how many women were lined up against them. So he begins to appoint women ca uh, cabinet members in his cabinet, right? That's the cosmetic answer, right? Um, I would say that if you think of protest movements as a, um, I think of them as a, as a Olympic, when you're a team of runners in Olympics, you run and you pass the baton to your teammate and then they get the baton and then they run. The green movement was one big leap forward where women took the baton from their predecessors, moved it forward in a fast spree, and then they passed it on to the, to the, to the, the next generation of women. So in that regards, I would say that um, they showcase that they are indeed educated, empowered, politically active. They know they are able to connect the dots. They don't need me or any man to tell them so. They are able to connect the dots between their reality and, and the country. They're fierce um, and they, they proved it really in the movement. They had proved it a long time ago. I mean, even in the, in the Fadayan, a lot of the guerrilla fighters who took up arms against the Shah's government were women, women, female guerrilla fighters. So in that regards, um, there's affirmation in the level of activism they had. And a younger generation is now being, uh, is being raised in the country post 2009, and they're picking up where the green movement left off. And that's why you see them becoming more and more emboldened. They are outright by themselves, taking off their hijab, facing arrest, or one of them ended up lighting herself on fire because they weren't allowed to see sports movies or, or, or enter sports, uh, men's sports stadiums. So I think that one, the one thing that you could say that they, the lesson here is that they're a force and they they are they have affirmed their place in society and in in many ways, this is why I was turned on to this research in the first place was because they are the incubators of change in the country. Series. <laughs> Uh, BerkeleyLectures.org uh, برنامه آینده ما uh, برنامه بعدی ما هست uh, موضوعی سخنرانیم هست قرارداد 25 ساله بین ایران و چین uh, آقای دکتر یونس جلالی 15 آگست ساعت 11 صبح به وقت قرب آمریکا. ممنونم از همه گیر Thank you all, thank you so much, مرسی ممنونم